Hello, <clears throat> God bless you. My name is Stephen. I'm the pastor of Graffiti Fellowship. Um, we're located in the Brooklyn borough of New York City. We're on the very far south side of Brooklyn in a community called Coney Island. It's located right on the Atlantic Ocean. Uh, it's home to what's probably the most famous amusement district in the world. Beautiful uh, beach, boardwalk. Uh, it's also a community where uh, people live. And it's a wonderful place. Uh, this is our daily devotion. This is where we take a chapter from the Bible. We read it together so that we can uh, include a bit of God's Word in our day-to-day -day lives. And we just think that's a good thing to do. We think it's one of the best things to do. And so we wanted to create a tool like this one just to help uh, facilitate that. We are reading today Luke chapter... 13. <clears throat> it's, a, it's a shorter chapter, certainly compared to Luke chapter 12 at 35 verses. And there are uh, 24 chapters in the Gospel of Luke. And so in our last video, we read Luke chapter 12. And so now we're uh, kind of on the backside, the second half of the Gospel of Luke. We've passed the halfway point. In Luke chapter 13, uh, the first subsection, beginning in verse 1, is subtitled, A Call to Repentance. Next, we have the parable of the barren fig tree. Jesus heals on the Sabbath. The parable of the mustard seed. Parable of the yeast. The narrow door. And then Jesus grieves over Jerusalem. Let's read together now Luke chapter 13, and uh, as I mentioned from time to time, I'm reading from the New Living Translation of the Bible. There are many different English translations of the Bible. I have no idea how many, officially a lot. And uh, they, you know, all have their unique strengths. This is what we call a contemporary English translation, which just means it's in modern English. Uh, we think that's pretty useful when it comes to just understanding. Most English translations available today are in contemporary English. Uh, what we like about the New Living Translation is it's the easiest reading level for the greatest number of people. Uh, it's not written in very academic language. Um, it's not a word-for-word -word translation. Some other contemporary English translations are, and, and there is a value in that, particularly when we're talking about research, when we're talking about sort of deep dive academic study. Uh, if you've studied any, any language, other than your native language, you'll know that sometimes word-for-word -word translations uh, just become very clunky. Uh, they just don't mesh very well. The speakers of that particular language, uh, often the, their syntax would be different than another language. And so a literal word-for-word -word translation, uh, sometimes things are lost in translation or sometimes things become confusing. And so this particular translation focuses on the idea to be communicated and just puts it in the kind of language that we would use uh, just normally in everyday uh, conversation. And so we think that's helpful when it comes to just understanding what we're reading. And uh, we just think that has a lot of value. We're not saying this is the only translation. We're not saying it's the best translation. These are just the reasons that we've chosen uh, this one for this tool. And this is also the one that we use, uh, that we teach from in our church. Love all the other translations, though. We're not translation snobs at Graffiti. Luke chapter 13 begins, About this time Jesus was informed that Pilate had murdered some people from Galilee as they were offering sacrifices in the temple. Do you think those Galileans were worse sinners than all the other people from Galilee? Jesus asked. Is that why they suffered? Not at all. And you will perish too unless you repent of your sins and turn to God. What about the 18 people who died when the uh, tower in Siloam fell on them? Were they the worst sinners in Jerusalem? No. 
And I tell you again, unless you repent, you will perish too. Then Jesus told the story, a man planted a fig tree in his garden and came again and again to see if there was any fruit on it. And he was always disappointed. Finally, he said to his gardener, I've waited three years and there hasn't been a single fig. Cut it down. It's just taking up space in the garden. The gardener answered, sir, leave it one, give it one more chance. Leave it another year and I'll give it special attention and plenty of fertilizer. If we get figs next year, fine. If not, then you can cut it down. One Sabbath day, as Jesus was teaching in a synagogue, he saw a woman who had been crippled by an evil spirit. She had been bent double. I mean, she was just bent over at the waist for 18 years and was unable to stand up straight. And when Jesus saw her, he called her over and said, Dear woman, you are healed of your sickness. And then he touched her and instantly she could stand straight. How she praised God. But the leader in charge of the synagogue was indignant, that means furious, that Jesus had healed her on the Sabbath day. There are six days of the week for working, he said to the crowd. Come on those days to be healed, not on the Sabbath. But the Lord replied, you hypocrites. Each of you works on the Sabbath day. Don't you untie your ox or your donkey from its stall on the Sabbath and lead it out for water? This dear woman, a daughter of Abraham, has been held in bondage by Satan for 18 years. Isn't it right that she be released even on the Sabbath? I might add, especially on the Sabbath. This shamed his enemies, but all the people rejoiced at the wonderful things he did. And then Jesus said, what is the kingdom of God like? How can I illustrate it? It's like a tiny mustard seed that a man planted in a garden, and it grows and becomes a tree, and the birds make nests in its branches. He also asked, what else is the kingdom of God like? It's like the yeast a woman used in making bread. Even though she put only a little yeast in three measures of flour, it permeated every part of the dough. Jesus went through the towns and villages, teaching as he went, always pressing on toward Jerusalem. Someone asked him, Lord, will only a few be saved? He replied, work hard to enter the narrow door to God's kingdom, for many will try to enter, but will fail. When the master of the house has locked the door, it'll be too late. You'll stand outside knocking and pleading, Lord, open the door for us. But he'll reply, I don't know you or where you've come from. And then you'll say, but we ate and drank with you. We, uh, you taught in our streets. And he'll reply, I tell you, I don't know you or where you come from. Get away from me, all you who do evil. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth, for you'll see Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and all the prophets in the kingdom of God, but you'll be thrown out. And people will come from all over the world, from east and west, north and south, to take their places in the kingdom of God. And note this, some who seem least important now will be the greatest then, and some who are the greatest now will be least important then. At that time, the Pharisees said to him, get away from here if you want to live. Herod Antipas wants to kill you. Jesus replied, Go tell that fox that I'll keep on casting out demons and healing people today and tomorrow and on the third day I'll accomplish my purpose. Yes, today and tomorrow and the next day I must proceed on my way, for it wouldn't do for a prophet of God to be killed except in Jerusalem. He's saying, He knows where to find me. O oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones God's messengers. How often have I wanted to gather your children together as a hen protects her chicks beneath her wings, but you wouldn't let me. And now, look, your house is abandoned, and you'll never see me again until you say blessings on the one who comes in the name of the Lord. That's the end of <clears throat> Luke chapter 13. Um, a lot of great teaching here, as uh, always. And, um, you know, Jesus here takes an antagonistic approach to the Pharisees and the, the other religious leaders, as he, as he generally does. But there's a, just a, a little increase in the intensity because Jesus here has been, uh, we see in the early part of the chapter, has been an instrument of great love and mercy toward a woman whose life has been dominated by an affliction. And that affliction, the scripture is very clear here, is caused 
uh, by by a, a, an, an, an evil attack, a, a demonic affliction. And Jesus heals her, but he does so on the Sabbath. And, and these religious leaders have a very, they have a lot of very strict legalistic rules on what can be done on the Sabbath and what cannot be done on the Sabbath. And basically Jesus says, if, if God, if, if we can't be used by God to defeat the enemy of God on the Sabbath of all days, what are we even doing? By the way, and I would add this commentary, when God heals somebody miraculously, it is God who heals somebody miraculously. It's not anybody else. And this demonstration here of um, Jesus being faithful to God, hearing God and obeying God, and casting out this oppressive force from the woman and administering healing to her, these religious leaders who are attacking this are attacking God because it is God who chooses to heal. This, this power and authority comes from God. And so there's a real irony here. Uh, they're criticizing God for not following God's rules, and they completely miss the spirit of the rule. Um, and then Jesus goes on to teach about his, his kingdom. And then he's warned, hey, Jesus, you're, ah, you're, you're upsetting the uh, status quo a bit here. By the way, you need to watch out for not just the Jewish leaders who you've obviously upset, but you need to watch out for the Roman leaders as well because they're now oppressing others. And uh, Jesus says, listen, I'm going to do what, I'm, what I came to do. They know where to find me. They can find me in Jerusalem because that's where they kill all the prophets anyway. I'm on my way there. And so Jesus is just taking a a defiant stand, yes, but it's not a stand. He's, he's not trying to be defiant for the sake of being defiant. He's just being obedient to God without fear. And that's his message. That's his testimony to them. He's like, listen, I'm going to do what I was sent here to do. You guys know where I'll be. Really what he's saying is, I'm not worried about you. I'm only worried about my Father who sent me and doing his will. Let's stop there. That's Luke chapter 13. Thanks so much for participating in this video. I hope it's blessed you. I think it might bless some others that you know. So uh, if, uh, if you would agree, feel free to, to, to share this with, with others. Our only, our only purpose in doing this, and it does take a little bit of work to create these videos, our only purpose in doing any of this is just trying to get God's Word into the hands of people who need it. And we think that's everybody. We think everybody needs God's Word, and um, I, there, there's just something to be said for, for simple, uh, effective tools like this that, that can help. So thanks so much for, for being here. God bless you. Looking forward to seeing you next time in Luke chapter 14. Take care.